Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you all in the name of our Savior, the one who loved you and gave himself for you, that you might know what eternal life is. I hope and I pray that in this morning hour of worship that you are consciously thinking about the love of Christ for you. I hope to develop that theme here today. I hope to develop that from within the context of uh, Revelation chapter 3. I'd like to ask you to take your Bible and turn there once again. Revelation chapter 3, we're looking again at the church in Philadelphia. You might remember that last week when we came across this passage of Scripture for the first time, one of the things that I tried to emphasize at that point was that Christ's relationship with his church is a relationship of love. It's established upon the love for, that Christ has for his church. And this love that Christ has for his church is manifested in a number of different ways here in this passage of Scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And just to, to jog your memory a little bit, you might remember uh, that some of the things that we uh, pointed out uh, concerning Christ's love for the church at Philadelphia, that that love that Christ had was a love, again, that was based on his awareness of their work and their love for him. Now, don't get me wrong. He did not love them because, he, uh, because they first loved him. Obviously not. But this whole element of Christ's relationship to his church is always to be understood as a relationship that is based on love. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That love for Jesus, that love that Jesus Christ has for the church, you might remember that we spoke about this last week as well. That love that Jesus Christ has for his church is a sanctifying love. Christ's love for his people, Christ's love for you as an individual, it manifests itself in your life and in the life of the church by way of a conformity to the very person in the image of Christ. Holiness worked in the individual. Holiness worked in the church. And that's what we saw last week. You remember there in the letter that our Lord uh, uh, had uh, dictated uh, to John uh, to give to the church at Philadelphia. He identified himself as the one who is holy. And we emphasized that last week. This idea that Christ is holy and all those who are united to him by faith have holiness worked in them. And so that's why we made that point of emphasis. But his love for this church in Philadelphia also manifested itself in other ways as well. Number one, it manifested itself in giving opportunity to this church. You remember, he says, I have set before you an open door. Yes, church of Philadelphia, if you have little strength. Yes, you don't have much by way of what this world uh, considers to be a great, in significance, but you, a great in significant, but you do have something. You have a little strength. And because you have that little strength, I have set before you an open door, an open door that no man can shut you remember. And so again, this is a way in which Christ showed his love to this church. He gave them further opportunity for ministry and service. I want you to know and understand, and I hope and I pray that each and every one of us are looking for opportunity for service for Christ. When that opportunity comes to us, it's a token of Christ's love to you. That Christ would place within your sphere of responsibility some element to do for him. Some, some element, to, again, to bring glory to his name in this world in which we live. And so that love was seen in the giving of an opportunity. But the love was seen in three other ways as well, you might remember. Number one, it was seen, again, by way of his vindicating this church in Philadelphia. Remember uh, Jesus there in the passage of Scripture in, in uh, Revelation chapter 3, 7 through 13? Uh, again, says, uh, he says, I know those who, are the, who say they are Jews, but are not, but of the synagogue of Satan. This was something of the ostracism that the church was experiencing in that time. And Christ goes on to say to this church, he says, those who have the synagogue of Satan, they will come and they will worship before your feet. Now, it doesn't mean that they, that, that, that they were going to worship uh, the church, but what it, did, what it does mean is essentially this, that they will identify truly that the church of Jesus Christ, that little church in Philadelphia, was a church that was beloved by Christ. In other words, Christ is vindicating them. In the presence of all their antagonists, Christ was vindicating them. I am saying to you, Christ still vindicates uh, his people today. Those who love Christ still receive the vindication of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ protects you. Christ watches over you. Christ, again, is for you, even though the world seems to be against you. And so he vindicates them. Th thirdly, uh, the, the next thing that we saw is not only did he vindicate them, but also he offered them protection in the world. Look there at that verse in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. 
And our Lord Jesus Christ says this, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation that shall come upon the whole earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. And our Lord Jesus Christ was saying to this little church, I am protecting you from that hour, hour of trial. You have kept my word, I will keep you. Now there's much by way of the theology of this verse that uh, maybe takes us a little further than what my scope is here this morning. I may touch on this, but this idea of that, uh, of that hour of trial that is to come upon the entire earth, I see that again as a reference to that time of great tribulation that is yet to befall the earth. And yet we, we would not remove it from its, uh, its, its application in the day and age in which our Lord gave it. He was protecting that little church. There was a time, again, by way of the persecutions of the first century, this church in Philadelphia was watched over, cared for, protected. And so Christ not only vindicates his people, Christ protects his people. And I want you to know, again, I'm going to repeat myself here a number of times, this vindication, this protection, that opportunity was all a manifestation of Christ's love for his church. Do you see how Christ loves his church? Amen. He, he, he purchased them with, with his own blood. He works holiness in them. He gives them opportunity. He vindicates them in the presence of their enemies. He again protects them in times of trial. And the last thing that we saw again by way of what Christ did that will do for his church is that he will reward them. Did you see there? I believe it's in verse 12 there where Christ says, He that overcometh, I will make to be a pillar uh, in the temple of my God, and I will write the name of my God upon him, I will write my name on him. And you might remember what we said last week by way of the historical setting of this church in Philadelphia in that area of Asia Minor. It was known uh, particularly to be prone to earthquakes. It was kind of right on a fault line. And I was actually looking at, uh, at, a, at a picture this morning of the, uh, of the ancient ruins there at Philadelphia. And you would see there are still like a number of uh, very, very tall columns but you realize those columns are just stacked one on top of another. And you can imagine what would happen if the ground underneath would begin to shake, which would happen in a time of an earthquake. And that's why the people in Philadelphia, oftentimes, when there was any threat of an earthquake, they would oftentimes leave the city. And when Jesus Christ says to this church, I will, put, uh, I, I, I will, I, I will make you a pillar of my, uh, of my God in the temple of my God, and you shall not go in and out anymore. He's saying to them, there is a place of security, stability for the believer. And Christ, again, what does this point to? It points to Christ's rewarding of his church. Do you see what Christ does by way of his love for his church? He purchases them with his blood. He works holiness within them. He gives opportunity for service. He vindicates them in the presence of their enemies. He protects them in a time of persecution. And he rewards them in the future. My friends, my brothers and sisters, those of you who are here visiting, have you considered this Christ to be your Savior? Have you come to that place where you understand what your sins will leave you with and what Christ promises to you? This is the gospel here that Jesus Christ is setting before us. It's all based on the reality of his love for you. Oh, the love of Jesus Christ for sinners, the love of Jesus Christ for you. It's a love that, again, just, it's a love that uh, just doesn't emote over you. It's a love that works holiness in you. It's a love that gives you opportunity for service. It's a love that keeps you and protects you. It's a love ultimately that rewards you. Oh, the love of God for his people, the love of Christ for sinners. And so I set him before you, and I ask you again, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, look to this one who can save the soul and bring you home to himself. Well, again, that's, that was emphasizing our point last week, this idea that Christ's relationship to his church is a relationship that's based on love. But what I want to do this morning, and you might remember I kind of forecasted this last week, this morning I want to talk about the church's relationship to Christ. And I believe that this is a, one of the ways in which this letter to the uh, Philadelphians could be uh, divided. It, we, there's a number of ways in one sense that we can divide up that letter. But when we look at the letter, uh, we see that there is what Christ is doing for the church, his relationship to the church, but we can also see in that letter the church's relationship to Christ. There are specific things that, that bring to our attention the kind of relationship that, Christ, that this church sustained to the person of Christ. And that's what we want to take a look at today. And so let's take a look at the passage of Scripture. Forgive me for, going, uh, for introducing so long without uh, reading the passage. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 uh, through 13. Please hear the word of God. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. 
I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, whole, upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Do you see a number of things here just in the reading of this little epistle, this little letter to this church? Do you see the, the great fact of Christ acknowledging his love for this church? Again, there in verse, uh, in, in, in verse uh, I, I believe it's in, in verse, and forgive me for this, in verse 9, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. This is the point of emphasis, that this is the point of entrance into this letter that I want to develop. It is once again that relationship of love that Christ sustains to his church. But I want you to see from this as well, and did you notice this as the passage was being read, that there are a number of things that point to the church's relationship to Christ. There is this church, again, even though it has a little strength, it has some strength, and it's exerting it for Christ. There was this church, again, even though it had a little strength, what was it doing? It was not denying his word. It was, staying, it was not denying his name. It was keeping his word of patience. It was witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, I want you to see that in this, in this letter, there is a relationship laid out before us of the church to Jesus Christ. And I'm here to say to you that that relationship is a relationship of love as well. So that we can make a broader statement and say essentially this. The relationship that Christ sustains to his church and the relationship that the church sustains to Christ is a relationship of reciprocal love. It's reciprocal love. Now, don't get me wrong. If I can say it this way, it's not equal love. There's priority in this, in this, whole, in this whole relationship of love. There's a priority by way, of, uh, by way of chronology, we might say. There's a, there's a priority by way of its source. We love him because he first loved us. We don't, we don't walk around thinking again that in ourselves we are able to love God. We ran from God. And oftentimes we fought against God. And I hate to say this. Allow me to say this though. It hurts me to say this. How many times have we shook our fist in the face of God? It hurts to say that. It really does. I wish I didn't have to say it. But if we're going to be honest with one another, don't, don't we have to say these things? And so here was God, here was, the, here was the Lord Jesus Christ, again, manifesting love. Here was God loving us even before we loved him, but all having experienced this love. This is why I want you to see that every positive element that this church is known for, and in many ways this church of Philadelphia is a model church. It's kind of interesting, I was looking up that little phrase, a model church, and interesting, you know a church came up in my study over and over again, was, was the Thessalonian church. The Thessalonian church, again, is kind of known for the fact that there's really no, no condemnation in the epistle there. Paul is not calling out any particular sin. And it's the same thing with this church in Philadelphia. No sin is made note of. And this is the one who knows all things. This is the one who is holy and true. This is the one who knows the standard of righteousness. And he looks at the church of Philadelphia, obviously not a perfect church, not a sinless church, but a model church. And what is a model church? A model church is that church that shows by way of its affections and by way of its actions, love for its Savior. And so I want you to hear and I want you to see once again that the church's relationship to Jesus Christ, the church of Philadelphia's relationship to Jesus Christ is a relationship of love. It is a reciprocal, a reciprocated love. This church loved Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ first loved this church. And again, this is something, again, that, uh, that we see. Look even back just a few pages there in Revelation chapter uh, 1, verse 5, concerning this idea of being loved by Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it's a beautiful passage. There's one of our hymns, I forget which hymn it is, uh, uh, incorporates the, this, uh, this, uh, this little phrase and incorporates this passage of Scripture at the heading of the hymn. And again, Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us in his blood. 
And again, wash us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus Christ loves you, you see. Jesus Christ sanctifies you. He washes you from, and me, from our own sins in his blood, in his own blood. And so this relationship of reciprocal love. You see, the idea of, of, of love being the predominant category that really explains everything by way of Christian activity is brought to our attention over and over again. And I want to kind of emphasize this point even before I get to the scripture passages that emphasize this. Every positive activity of the church or of the Christian for Jesus Christ is an activity that in its truest form springs from love for Christ. Anything that doesn't spring from love from Jesus Christ is, is, is defective, it's, it's hypocritical, it's, it's, it's religious dress where, where genuineness of nature has to be seen. But again, every true expression of faithfulness to Christ. And so when this church expresses itself by way of faithfulness and keeping the word, it's an expression of love. When this church expresses itself by way of devotion for Christ, you have not denied my name, it's an expression of love. When this church, again, exemplifies, and we might even say this, when this church has forecasted of it, the fact that it will stand fast, hold, uh, hold fast the name of Christ, and that it will overcome the world. Again, it's all springing from the reality of a love for Jesus Christ in the soul. We know these passages of Scripture. Again, I've already mentioned 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. John uh, chapter 14, verse 15, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, one of the things we're going to see here today by way of the, the, by way of the love of the church and by way of the, uh, of the love of the individual for Jesus Christ, there are various aspects or elements to this love that we have for Christ. There is an emotive element to be sure. And I want to say this without, without being, uh, uh, without being un unnecessarily emotional, without trying to make a, a tug or an appeal on your emotions, I do want your emotive love for Jesus Christ both to be present and to grow. Amen. I want there to be a longing in your soul for more of Christ. I want, again, we've sung the lily of the valley. I found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. And again, we can sing, we can reference so many other hymns here. But our Lord Jesus Christ, what does he say there in John 14? If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Christ is setting before us, again, the way that we express love to him. Forgive me, I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm not trying to be uh, anything. But he doesn't say, if you love me, buy me flowers. If you love me, give me a gift. If you love me, do... No, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's what this church in Philadelphia did. It kept the word of Christ, even in a situation, in a circumstance, where it would have been very easy to deny the name of Christ. But it stayed faithful to Christ. John 14, 23, and Jesus answered and said to them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Oh, the blessedness of loving Christ and of loving God to have this kind of fellowship with, uh, with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I said before, this whole idea of the church's relationship with love, I'm sorry, the church's relationship with Christ is a relationship of love. It's a reciprocal love. It's a, love, it's a love that has a certain priority to it. And I would suggest to you that if you look at this letter, again, and examine it, not by way of the activity of Christ for the church, but now by way of the activity of the church towards Christ, you would, we could probably make a case that there are about eight things that this church actually is doing for Christ. Some of them are actually happening in the present as, as, as the epistle was being written. And some of them are actually said, I would say this, in a way that forecast what their faithfulness will be. And in knowing these things, it will help us. Because I do think that it's the desire of every true church of Christ, not a synagogue of Satan. And again, this synagogue of Satan has this idea of claiming to be one thing and yet not in reality. Why did our, our Lord Jesus Christ use that term, a synagogue of Satan, sets us back on our heels, does it not? We use that because there are those in those synagogues who claim to be uh, Jews in the truest sense of the word, yet they denied the Messiah. And there are those in the church of Jesus Christ who claim to be Christians and yet deny Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They may see Jesus Christ as a great lover of humanity. One of the things that we're going to see here today, it may be shocking for you to hear me say this, one of the things that we have to say here today is that true love for Jesus Christ prioritizes that love of Christ over all things. 
if I love, so I'll, I'll, I'll say this in a way that potentially could be as, as shocking as possible. If I love sinners more than I love Christ, I don't love Christ properly. Now I say that in a way to be shocking. Because we think, again, what's the Christian supposed to The Christian, of course, is supposed to love sinners. You're supposed to go and preach the God, and you must love them. But if you love sinners more than you love Christ, you're coming short of what Christ calls you, how Christ call, is calling you to love. And we can, we, can, we can add things to this. If I love, again, no offense, but if I love this church more than I love Christ, you're in a dangerous spot. If, if I love my family more than I love Christ, it's not good for my family. If I love this culture more than I love Christ, it's not good for this culture. And so again, these things we are confronted with. And what I want you to see here over and over again is this love for the Lord Jesus Christ is something that Christ notes and something that Christ finds commendable. And when it comes to the evaluation of this church, no ill thing can be said of this church because this church's relationship with Christ is a relationship that's marked by true love but a love that manifests itself in the following ways. Number one, I would draw your attention that this church was a working church. I know thy works. Number two, I would say to you that this church was a faithful church. Thou hast kept my word. Number three, I would say to you that this church was a devoted church. Thou hast not denied my name. Number four, I would say to you that this church even uh, this church was, a, was an ostracized church. They, they experienced the opposition of the, quote, unquote, the synagogue of Satan. Number five, this church was an enduring church. Thou hast kept the word of my patience. And there is something of a distinction between keeping the word of Christ and keeping the word of his patience. We might say it this way, keeping the word of Christ is the larger category. Keeping the word of his patience is a category within that where you and I, by way of the work of the Spirit within us and by way of the, the grace of God upon us, we are standing fast for Christ even when the easiest thing to do would be to deny Christ. This church did not deny Christ. They did not deny his name. They stood fast. Again, they kept the word of his patience. They are a church worthy of, uh, of reward. And this is kind of interesting. This is, a, this is another point within this letter uh, to the church at Philadelphia that there are some, some, some theological categories that we have to touch upon. And it may be beyond my scope in my sermon here this morning. Again, the first thing was that hour of trial that will come upon the whole earth. As I said before, I believe that's a reference to the Great Tribulation. We see that laid out in chapters 6 through 19. Excuse me. <clears throat> but this next reference here, I believe there it's in, uh, it's in verse, uh, verse 11. Jesus says this, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. This is very interesting, that no man take thy crown. And what our Lord Jesus Christ is saying to this church is essentially this. Dear church in Philadelphia, by way of this door of opportunity that I have opened up for you, there are things that I have called you to do. Do those things so that no one comes and takes your reward from you. Do those things so that another brother or sister in Christ doesn't come along and do the thing that you were in, that I intended you to do, and they do it, and they and you and they get the reward that I intended for you. Now, again, we don't develop this; we don't talk about this too much. Again, and there's a sense in which we talk about living for Christ. We die, we go to heaven, we enjoy Christ, and and again, sometimes we'll talk about the rewards that Christ gives. And some churches develop that rightly, so that is a an area of a, of Christian of personal eschatology that uh, does have to be emphasized. But the, the the concept of somebody taking our reward, we don't think of that too often. And do we? Remember what, uh, what Paul says uh, again there in Ephesians chapter 2 that, uh, that Christ has ordained certain works for, uh, for us. Again, we're, we're saved by grace if, for what? To do the works that Christ has ordained for us. There are works that Christ has ordained for this church. There are works that Christ has ordained for each of you. Are you doing those works? Christ's word of counsel or an admonition to you would be this don't let somebody else take that crown. Engage that. God will give you, he'll say, I'll give you all the grace you need. I will love you from point A to, to, to point Z and then making sure that you accomplish that which I've laid out for you. And so again, this church, as I said before, they were a church worthy of reward. And I do think in some of these things, when I'm, when I'm listing here the, the, these attributes of the church's love for Christ, some of those were present. Some of those, again, Christ was giving a word of exhortation. But I think in one sense we can, we can I, don't think we're, I don't think it's much of a stretch when we say, we can assume that the church was fulfilling these things. So they were a church that was worthy of reward. They were a church that was overcoming. The him that overcometh, Jesus says there again, I believe in verse 12, I, I will give, uh, I will, I, I will uh, uh, you know, bring him into the, into the temple of my God. 
And then lastly, uh, this church was a church that had an ear to hear what the Spirit said to the church. This is a, this is a wonderful phrase, isn't it? Uh, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. This occurs, again, in every letter here in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation. It occurs later on in the book of Revelation as well. And do you remember how we were handling that concept? He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We were emphasizing that that hearing what the Spirit says to the churches really has to do with the words that Christ was giving to those churches. And if you ask the question, well, how do I know what the Spirit is saying? Go to the Word of God. In every one of these cases, our Lord Jesus Christ says to the church in Philadelphia or Smyrna or, or Pergamos, write. And when you hear what the Spirit is saying to the, to the church, you're hearing what Christ has given in His Word. If I can say it this way, we're locked up to the Word by way of this insight into God's purposes and God's will. And so this church, again, these, these things... Well, we've had eight things here in general. If we had to, and I'm going to do this, we can reduce those eight to basically three categories. And the categories are essentially this. There are categories of love, categories of faithfulness, categories of service. We might even further reduce it to say this, that love has two broad categories. Love exhibits itself in faithfulness, and love exhibits itself in devotion. Now let's take a look at some of these things here. Well, when I say that our Lord Jesus Christ is laying out that this church is a model church and it's based on its, on its love for uh, Christ. I'm not in any way taking away anything from any of the other passages that our Lord gives by way of how we are to be known in this world as followers of Christ. You remember what Jesus says in John 13, I think it's verse 35, By this shall all men know that, that you are my disciples, by your love one for another. And so this prioritized love for Christ doesn't negate a secondary love or, or a love or a love that has to be uh, emphasized that takes place on a horizontal level. You and I must be known for our love one for another. Our love for one another must be true. It must be genuine, genuine. It must be deep. It must reflect the love that we first received from Jesus Christ himself. But in this passage of scripture, we have to find that, if I can say it this way, we, we would find that pretty much in the service that the church is exhibiting in the name of Christ when Christ commends this church and sets it before us as, a, as an exemplary or a model church, everything has to do with the church's activity toward Christ flowing from and based on love. I'm going to get to a point of application here fairly quick, much quicker than I normally do. What does our love at Nauset Baptist look like? Is our love for Christ a discernible love? Would Christ look at this church and say, again, nothing to, be con uh, nothing to be condemned? And if Christ did put his finger on something, would we be quick to respond by way of repentance and by way of humility before God Almighty? If there was a, if there was a word, again, to the, to the quote-unquote, to the angel of the church at Nauset, and there was a failure on the part of the angel of the church at Nauset, would the messenger, would the minister of the angel of the church at Nauset, would he repent? I pray that, pray that I would. And if there were things by way of the, the by way of the by, by way of the identity of this church, you know, all churches have identities. We we've talked about this in the past. And what if in our church, what if we what if now? I'm not saying these things are true. As I was as I was preparing for the sermon, I was listening to men who were able to say to their congregations, "I believe that we are a, a Philadelphia type church." They were able to uh, the, these men were able to say that uh, by way of the by way of the activity by way of the conduct by way of the mindset of the church the church was the, the church from the standpoint of the minister was reflecting everything again that would make for a model church and so again it, it, it's an encouragement to see that but but if, but if our Lord Jesus Christ would say something to our church if, if, what, if what if our Lord Jesus Christ said you know you're not you're, you're not very zealous in your works for me would it be would we be willing to repent? What if our Lord Jesus Christ said, you know, you're, you're not very circumspect when it comes to these doctrinal matters. Would we repent of that? What if our Lord Jesus Christ says, you know, you have an awareness of others within, within, with, within the circle of your fellowship that are suffering greatly and you've not lifted a finger. Would we repent of that? And so again, I'm not trying to in any way uh, be oppressive this morning on this dear congregation uh, that, that, that Christ has brought here. I'm just laying these things out for us all. This is why I said if there was a word, uh, there was a word of Jesus Christ uh, toward the minister, toward the pastor, would I be quick to repent? You must pray that I would be, as I, as I must pray that you would be. You see, again, these things Christ sees. And what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make to you is this. If I, I was just saying this in another context to somebody this past week, I'm convinced, I'll say this again, I've said it here before, I'm convinced 
if by the grace of God, through the ministry of the word here, you are brought to a greater and deeper love for Christ, half of the pastoral work here is done. It is. Because love for Christ will motivate you. And in and, and these eight things that we've seen, these will be the very expression of your faith, the very expression of your, uh, of your Christian life. And so again, Christ's emphasis at this point. Well, again, this church uh, is known for its love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I, I, I am convinced that everything that our Lord points out here, these eight different things that we've seen here, they are genuinely an expression of love. And there's a sense in which when we take a look at the church's love for Christ, what should that look like? If maybe this concept is new to me, what should I expect? Should I expect to feel butterflies in my stomach uh, uh, for the person of Christ? And let me say this, don't get me wrong, and you can, you can call me out on this if you want, but I do think there should be something of a preciousness about Christ, something of a love for Christ, something of an excitement for Christ, again, more than just quote-unquote butterflies, but a true, effective love for Jesus Christ. I think Peter was talking about this when he said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I do think that there was a true emotive element to that love that Peter was speaking of here. And again, I don't want to I don't want to uh, 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 blow that out of proportion to where we become so uh, yeah, so moved with emotion and uh, and and uh, just uh, things on the surface that there's no solidity solidity to our Christian faith. But without that, you see, again, we 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 really come short of what love is. But love is also that which manifests itself by way of its action and activity. We see this again. Here was this church that not having much by way of the world standard standards. Again, he says, thou hast a little strength. Church may have looked at itself and says, well, what can we do again in, you know, in the face of the larger culture? How can we make a contribution here? How can we, again, have any real impact on society around us? And Christ doesn't say, you know, he, uh, he, he doesn't say, you, you don't have much, so don't even worry about it. No, he says, look, you have a little strength, but you're using it. And my point is this. Love says concerning the beloved, though I have little strength, but little strength I have, I give freely to you. I offer it in your service. And so you may look at your lives and you may say, well, there's, you know, there's, I'm, I'm just starting out and I'm just beginning and there's not much by way of formed ideas in, in my head concerning the things of Christ. I would call you to consider those things and I would call you to prioritize Christ. But I would also say to you is this again, what little you have. And if you're young here, you don't know how much you have. But what little you have, give it to Christ. Or you may be here again, all those gray heads here, you may be here again saying, what, what do I have left? You got a week left? You got a day left? Give it to Christ. Love Christ, you see. And so again, this church is a model church because even though it has little strength, it is exhibiting, it is exerting that strength on this, on, 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 for the cause of Christ. And again, that's what love is. Love is not merely a motive. Love is action as well. Love does certain things. You remember we did our exposition on 1 Corinthians 13. And all of those descriptors of love are all, again, ideas of action. Love does certain things or it doesn't do certain things. And so, again, while we romanticize love, and I'm not trying to move anything away, I'm repeating myself here, remove anything by way of the, the emotional element of love, there's much, much more to that. And, that. and this church had that. And all true churches of Christ have that as well. What little a church has, it willingly gives itself and gives of itself for the cause of Christ. And so again, thou hast a little strength. We also see again in this church, uh, uh, again, not, not only the, the fact that it was uh, giving itself, we see that this, uh, that, this, that this love for Christ is marked by devotion. And I think we see that uh, if you look again at verse 8. He says this, thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. That's the faithfulness of the church. I think, we, I think we can categorize the second part here as devotion. Thou hast kept my word and has not denied my name. I do think this has a devotional element to it. I think that there is an element of love that has moved this church even in the face of much opposition and even in the face when it would have been very easy to deny the name of Christ. That church says, nope, I'm not going there. I don't know much, but I got a Savior who gave his life for me and I'm not moving away from I don't know much, but I know, what I, I know what I would be apart from the grace of God and the one who has changed me. I'm not turning my back on him. And maybe this is the way the church at, at Philadelphia spoke. Maybe it was in more measured terms. Maybe the church was saying to itself, how can we leave this one who has done so much for us? 
How can we leave this one who has promised so much for us? But what I want you to see and understand that this church was devoted to Jesus Christ. More love for Christ, half the work is done. You see, this church loved Jesus Christ. And again, not denying, they did, this church did not deny his name. Well, how would that have happened? Well, I think we know how this happens. Sometimes and rarely in our life, at least to this point, we've been put in a very like black and white, ultimate kind of decision, deny Christ, uh, deny Christ and live, or, you know, or, 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 or kind of adjust your, 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 your commitment to Christ uh, in, in some way. We, we, we're not put in that situation that much. But I think we are put in situations where, yeah, you know, I know my, my job is this, and my circle of friends, you know, if I really, if I keep talking about the gospel, I think they're done with it. I think they don't want to hear it anymore. So, so maybe what I'll do is maybe in order to be a, a good witness, I'll just kind of not mention Christ as much. As though we can be a good witness without mentioning Christ. That's the kind of, that's the kind of folly we, we end up in when we begin to acquiesce to the pressures that are outside of us. And this church didn't. You stop and think of other ways in which uh, we can deny the name of Christ in our day. We have to say these things right now. The, the hot button issue is, is, is abortion. And we can deny the name of Christ by soft, going soft on the whole matter of abortion. The whole thing of homosexual marriage. Isn't it amazing? Homosexual marriage seemed to be like the blazing, <clears throat> the blazing uh, uh, controversy uh, in society, and especially within the church. And, and sadly, uh, uh, the, the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, going, the whole uh, uh, approval of, of homosexual marriage in our society uh, was approved. And did you notice it wasn't? I don't think it was months after that. This new thing called transgenderism became the, the hot button issue. And so the church has stepped back from one issue. The church has stepped back from another issue. And before you know it, the church has denied the name of Christ. Philadelphia didn't do that. Love doesn't do that, you see. Love says, look, I'm not looking for a fight. I'm not looking to be outcast. I'm not looking to be ostracized. But I am not, by God's grace, giving up my Savior. That's what this church did. And I'm saying to you, this was a manifestation of love. Sometimes the denial of Christ is as, is as black and white as Peter's. You remember the, the example there with Peter in Matthew 26? Again, after a short while, they came unto him and stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. You remember that when we looked at this passage of Scripture in the Gospel of Mark, the, the, way, that, the, the way that Peter denies Christ, it's, I don't, I don't even know who he is. I'm not, let alone being one of his disciples. I, I don't even know who he is. Well, sometimes the, 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 the tension of denial isn't that black and white in front of us. Isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ calls this Peter back to himself? And maybe I'm beating you up here this morning. And I tell, I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, I have no intention to beat you up. But I'm here to tell you whatever sins you or I may be guilty of, this Jesus Christ, this one who loves his church, this one who loves his people, he draws us back. And whatever your sin is and whatever your failure is, he'll draw you back. He'll seek you out. He'll say to others, go and tell Peter, go and tell this one, and go and tell them that I've risen from the dead. Go and tell this one that his sins are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Go and tell that one that, yes, his sin may be as, as, as horrible as he could ever think it is, but there's the blood of the cross as the blood of the Lamb. And so this church would not deny Jesus Christ. It's something to see. And I think that by way of this, this love, again, this devotion, thou hast not denied my name. So many passages of Scripture bring out this element of love in the, in the relationship of, 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 uh, of the church with, with Christ. I think of one passage here in John chapter 10 where Christ is the great shepherd of the sheep. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not in by the door of the sheepfold, but climbeth in some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth, the door of, is the, the, but he that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now listen to this. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep... Hear his voice, and when he calleth his own sheep by name, he leads them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice, verse 5, and a stranger they will not follow. So our challenge today, 
is when we hear all of these strange voices telling us what the love of God should be like. When we hear all these strange voices telling us what compassion is really like. When we hear all these strange voices basically completely overturning the very system of holiness and the very system of righteousness that God has revealed in His Word. Do the true sheep of Jesus Christ hear that voice? I don't think so. I don't think so. What they do is they get closer to their shepherd. They know they, things might get tough, so they get closer to the shepherd. And so here is, the, here is this church. And again, we say these things not to be offensive, not to beat people up, but, but why is it that so many, so many in the professing church defect in these matters? Well, to cut to the quick, or to, to, to cut to the quick, John the Apostle answers this, doesn't, doesn't he? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us because they were never of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You see, there are many, again, who congregate around either the person of Christ or the idea of Christ, but who are not united to him by faith. This is why I said before, the very fact that, that the relationship that Christ has with this church is a relationship of love and holiness. When you see, when you feel these, these pools of love in your heart for Christ, that's positive. That's why, that's why in spite of all the dangers of over-emotionalizing the love of God, and there are dangers with that, over-emotionalizing it, that's why I don't hesitate to bring these things up, because you must love Christ. There must be a pull, a tug in your heart for the person of Christ. But Christ is holy as well. These things say that he that is holy and he that is... That's why, again, your desire to be conformed more and more to Christ is just essential to the well-being of your Christian walk. Well, again, this church was manifesting its love, love by, way of its devo uh, by way of its devotion for Christ. It was manifesting itself by way of its faithfulness to Christ. And we'll move on here a little quickly. It was manifesting itself by way of its faithfulness to Christ. Did you see there in verse 8? I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. Again, this is, what, this is the faithfulness of this church, that this church kept the word of, Je of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10, we have the same thing, but there's a little different point of emphasis. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. As I said earlier, if, if, if we can have, uh, use categories right here, the, uh, keeping the word would be the larger categor category. The word of patience would be the smaller category. And what the word of patience is, is essentially this. It is the believer staying true to Christ in those areas that call for faithfulness and patience in a hostile situation. So even in spite of pressure, the Christian says, no, I'm not moving away from Christ. I'm not, again, acquiescing. Now, again, the whole idea is that I'm not asking you to be I'm not asking you to, to, to engage uh, your friends or, or culture or society uh, by way of this uh, being a wrecking ball. You've probably heard me say that before. But you must hear what is being said to you. You must evaluate it and filter it through the word of Christ. And you must know where to take your stand. There are certain places where the Christian, to be a true follower of Christ, cannot and will not go. And so again, Christ sees this in this church. And because of that... He commends this church. And that's why I said it, it, this is all based on reciprocal love. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, we have the great uh, picture again of the victory of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter seven, uh, 17, verse 14, we read the following. And these make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lord and King of kings. Now listen to this. And they which are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Faithfulness is a mark of your love for Christ. Not only is devotion a mark of your love, but faithfulness is a mark of love for Christ as well. So keeping the word of patience. Again, we can go on here, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll bring this uh, somewhat to a close here. As I said before, the things that are present in the text is what that church was actually doing. The things that are future to the text, I don't think it's a stretch to say that this church at Philadelphia would have been faithful in these areas as well. I think it's, it's safe to say that this church would have been an overcoming church, to him that overcometh. And again, you remember that word of exhortation was given to every one of the churches, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. Also, again, in verse 13, he that hath an ear, let him hear. And what's interesting about that is this. A church may be a model church, but a church still needs the, the encouragement and the exhortation of Christ to continue on. He that overcomes. Well, I thought this was an overcoming church. It is an overcoming church. But they, that overcoming church needs to hear the words of Christ. To, he, to him that overcomes. 
I thought, I thought this church was a church that was, that was hearing and obeying uh, what the Spirit said to the church. It, it was. But even that church needs to hear. Keep on in this way. He that hath an ear to hear. And so, church, family, brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, I, I, I lay before you these words of Christ. And, and again, it, it, these, this is a very, this is a commendable church. And, and, and I almost feel in, in a certain sense that I've, that, I've, that I've constructed here or developed here uh, an attitude of, 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 of spiritual depression, and it's not my intention to do that. But I want you to see here that what our Lord is saying about this church can be true of every church of Christ that is united to him by faith and that experiences that reciprocation of love having been first loved by God and by Christ, we can now love him. And that love looks like something specific. And so, my friends and my brothers and sisters, I ask you the question, what does the love of Nosset Baptist Church look like? What does it look like? And this is one of these things, again, I can, I, 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 in one sense, I, I can say that, and, and I'm not saying this just to say this, in one sense, I can say, I'm very thankful for this church. Not in one sense, in an ultimate sense, I'm very thankful for this church. Thankful for the people here. I'm thankful for what goes on here. But are we all, but are we all that Christ is calling us to be? We must always again have our ear open to what the Spirit says to the churches. And what the Spirit says to the churches is what's contained in the Holy Word of God. And that's why, by the grace of God, when this church gathers for worship or for study, it will be the scriptures that are spoken from. Because Christ speaks to his church in and through his word. Oh, well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus Christ loves you. He gave himself for you. He's working on your behalf. May you and I know the exhilaration and the thrill of working for Christ and being faithful to Christ in our day and in our age. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of Christ and for the ongoing work of your spirit and for the ministry of your word. Be with us, we pray, Heavenly Father, and conform us more and more to the image of your dear Son, and may our love for him grow deeper and deeper. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.